evening, everyone. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Robert Putnam, Shailen Romney Garrett, and Spiro Bolos. Thanks for attending. We're a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice, among others. We have over 100 videos of past events archived on our website and YouTube channel, so please be sure to explore. And now for my formal introductions. I will also offer an introduction of Mr. Bolo so that he will not appear until later on in the program. Robert Putnam is the Peter and Isabel Malkin Professor of Public Policy at Harvard University, having retired from active teaching in May of 2018. He has written multiple books, translated into 20 languages, including the best-selling Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community, and Our Kids, The American Dream and Crisis, a groundbreaking examination of the growing opportunity gap. Fan was honored to host Professor Putnam in 2018 for a talk on Our Kids at Evanston Township High School. Professor Putnam recently completed a study of broad 20th century American economic, social, political, and cultural trends entitled The Upswing, co-authored by Shailen Romney Garrett. Ms. Romney Garrett is a writer and social entrepreneur who has dedicated her life to the pursuit of connection, community, and healing in an increasingly fragmented world. She is a founding contributor to the Aspen Institute's initiative Weave, the Social Fabric Project, and writes about her personal journey back to community on her blog, Project Reconnect. Spiro Bolos is a 26-year veteran of the classroom, having taught a wide range of courses in the social studies department at Nutra High School in Winnetka and at various other institutions in the past. Mr. Bolos's instructional methods, which include a strong emphasis on media literacy, have been studied by researchers from Northwestern, Kent State, and the Harvard School of Education. He is the president of the Nutra High School Education Association, serving a second term. Let's now welcome Bob Putnam, Shailen Romney Garrett, and later Spiro Bolos. Thank you very much. Um, it's good to be, I should say, back uh, in uh, on the North Shore. Um, Lonnie, I appreciate those, those that that uh, kind introduction, and I'm looking forward to talking. The one thing you omitted is that um, I have a lot of ties, especially to ETHS. Uh, my wife. Uh, whom people will meet later on in in the um, in the afterward in the after hour after hours uh, session uh, is a graduate of uh, ETHS, um, and uh, her parents lived for many years in um, on Hartzell Street in um, on the north side of um, Evanston. So I'm very familiar, and it's good to be back. And I'm trying to deal with the fact that um, Spiro is from. Let's see, what's the name of that other school out there? New Trier, I think is his. <laughs> um, in any event, it's great to be, it's great to be with you. Um, <clears throat> Shailene and I want to talk tonight, uh, give you a, a sense of what this book is about. And then we're looking forward to questions, comments and questions from Spiro and from, and from others. Um, uh, is, the, is the chat, is the uh, PowerPoint about to come up? I'm hoping sort of it is. Super. Um, so um, we're, this is a book we've, we've just published um, just a few months ago. And we're going to, the, the book has, in a way, two parts to it. They're, they're intermingled, but there are two parts. One is uh, some hard data about change in America over the last 125 years. And the second is a kind of a narrative intermingled with the data, a narrative about how America has changed over these years and what lessons we can learn from the patterns of uh, of this historic, these 125 years. I'm gonna begin uh, by, sh by talking about, if we can have the next slide, I'm gonna begin by talking about the, um, uh, the data and then, uh, and I'm gonna to try to do it in a way that's, that's reasonably consumer friendly. Um, and then later Shailen will come in and, and go over much of the same material, but talking about it from a more historical, in terms of a historical narrative. Um, so, we begin with the fact that it, and if America is today at a pickle, and there's probably only one thing that all Americans agree, which is we are in a real pickle. Um, and in particular, we're going to be showing in this um, in this discussion that America has reached historically high levels of political polarization, of economic inequality, of social isolation, 
and of cultural self-centeredness. That's that's what we find. That's the world the world in which we find ourselves. And you didn't have you don't have to do go more than just the today's uh, headlines to realize that's where we are. And so we want to begin by asking, how did we get here? And then later it's going to turn out that finding out how we got here is relevant to how we might get out of here. But if we can have the next slide, I'm going to show you a series of charts here. In this case, we're starting with polarization. And they, all the charts are going to have the same form. So they're going to be kind of easy to follow. The horizontal axis here is the um, uh, time from basically from the late 19th century until the early 21st century. Um, and the vertical axis is going to be measures of, in this case, political comedy, the opposite of, of a polarization, bipartisanship, you can think of it. Um, and so you can see in this graph that beginning in the late, uh, in, the, in, the in the 1890s, America was extremely polarized, very low levels of bipartisanship and, and comedy. Um, later on, we're going to say probably that was the most polarized that American politics and American life had been in American history, with the exception of the period from 1860 to 1865, the Civil War. So America was really polarized in 18 in the in the period in the late in the late 19th century. But then you see that coming out of that period, beginning in the early years of the 20th century, we begin to become a little more, a little more uh, cooperative politically. Pause for just a second. We in that period, we didn't become overnight all lovey-dovey, but the trend changed. We we pivoted from a period of great polarization to a, in a moving in a direction, or at least looking in a direction that was going to take us over the next 60 years to a more a less polarized America, a more cooperative, politically cooperative America. And you can see that trend is more or less steady through that whole period. There was a little bit of dip there, you can see in the in the 1920s, but then steadily through the 30s and 40s and 50s and into the 60s, let's pause up there at the 60s, very, very relatively low levels of political hostility, political polarization, high levels of bipartisanship. That's sort of symbolized by the president right in the middle of that decade of the 50s, Dwight Eisenhower, who would, historians all agree is the least, was the least partisan president in American history with the exception of, of George Washington. Now, I'm not saying that, that uh, Dwight Eisenhower caused that. I'm trying to say Dwight Eisenhower was a good symbol of the fact that in that period, America was very, we did a lot of, a lot of business across party lines. But then as you see, beginning in the 60s, that begins to dip a little bit. And then especially as we get into the 70s, we start becoming more polarized, much more polarized. And from then on, it just keeps getting every year more polarized. Um, keep going, just every year, the 80s and the 90s, pause about in there someplace. Now remember, Donald Trump doesn't come into the study until about there. And that's way, in, in other words, one of the things we're going to say is Donald Trump didn't cause this problem. His arrival in the, in the White House came very late in the process, really much further down. Keep going down I mean, because the polarization continues. It goes steadily more polarized. Then we get down to the middle. The last data point we have here is from 20, 2015. But actually, we all know, anybody in America knows, that it's become even more polarized ever day by day in the ensuing period. So now we're down below the level of of a, a political bipartisanship or above the level, level of political conflict, if you want to say polarization, America is now more polarized than it had been in, in the 1890s and just about as polarized as we were in the Civil War. I'm trying to say historically, we are currently in a very polarized politics. Um, let's go to the next slide, which looks at another measure of how we're doing. This is a measure of economic equality Basically, the gap between rich folks and poor folks in, um, in American life. And again, this, the data here begin in 1913, because that's when the IRS was created and we start having good, really quite reliable income data. And you can see if we had data going back further, we have a little less reliable data going back further. And back further, America was even more unequal. That was called the Gilded Age in American politics, the late 19th century and the, and the early 20th century and, and just into the 20th century. The Gilded Age was a period of great, a great 
huge gap between the folks, the, the folks on the Upper East Side of New York uh, in the mansions of the Upper East Side of New York and the folks in the Lower East Side of New York where we're living in tenement slums. Um, but then you see beginning about 1910, we're beginning to make, we start making slightly more progress toward a little more economic equality. Again, you see that in the 1920s, that, that, was the, that was a kind of a pause a little bit in this progress. That was sometimes called the roaring 20s when the stock market rose. But then coming out of the, uh, the 20s, even before the Great Depression, uh, a New Deal takes over, we begin having greater equality. It's, so it's not just the New Deal. And you can see during the late 20s, 30s, into the 40s, keep going into the 50s. Um, there's a little dip after the war, but then into the 50s and then the 60s and we're very now America in at that period. We're at the kind of height of America of economic equality in America, and again at that point we were we were not equal. Of course, we were, there were, there were rich people and poor people in America in the 1960s, but relative to ourselves, we were very much more equal. And indeed, relative to the rest of the world, America at that point looked like Sweden or something. We were relative. I mean, by that we were the difference between rich and poor in America then wasn't any bigger than it is was or is now in in Scandinavia, where notor uh, notoriously they have low levels of political inequality. But then, as you see, beginning slowly in the 60s, but then increasingly accelerating um, in the late 70s and, and especially in the 18, in 1980s and 1990s, more and more economic inequality. And you can see now we're down right now. And then if we, again, if we continue that out after 2015, and if any of you who've been following the news about the economy over the last four or five years know that rich folks have done very well in the last five years, poor people have done not, have done actually quite poorly. And therefore, we're now down. If we had the numbers all show, if we could show you exactly the numbers where we are now, we're back at the level we started with in the, in the first Gilded Age. We're now in what we could call a second Gilded Age. So let's look now at the next slide. Here, the next slide is, is what we call social cohesion. This is a measure of the degree to which Americans in their daily lives are connected with other people. So it's a measure of things like, to what extent do people uh, work on, in, in community organizations? To what extent do people know their neighbors? To what extent do people, uh, you know, how, how strong is the American family? Uh, how much do Americans trust each other? That's the, what we're measuring here. And you can get it, it looks pretty similar actually. In the 1890s, America was pretty uncohesive and, in a minute, Shailen will give you a little bit more of what that felt like at the time, but America was pretty uncohesive. But then again, look at this, very similar, beginning in the 19, in the first decade of the 20th century, and then sort of accelerating, um, become more cohesive. And what, let me remind you, what that means is families are becoming stronger. Um, people are trusting one another more. People are joining organizations more. Uh, people are, are um, joining organizations of all sorts more. Again, the same, you see the same pause in the 1920s, but then uh, coming out of the 20s and 30s, you see in the 40s and 50s, probably the greatest civic boom in American history. Um, every year in that period, the PTA and, and um, uh, community organizations of all sorts, including bowling leagues, which was a famous example I used. Every, every year, people, those organizations had more members every year that was the baby boom. So more people had more kids and they, more people were marrying and they were marrying earlier and so on until again, look at that sort of in the middle 1960s that suddenly reverses all of a sudden and begins to go the other direction. And here it's a steady downward trend every year for the last 50, 60 years really. Um, every year we've seen fewer membership and organizations, less trust in other people, um, more fragmented families, um, and, and, and less involvement in community life. People know their neighbors less well and so on, down to the, 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 the current period. Let's go to the next slide quickly. And finally, we're gonna to turn to measures of cultural solidarity. This, this is a, a measure, I'm not gonna be able to speak, explain it in detail, but it's based on hard numbers here, which show the degree to which Americans think of themselves as one, as a, as a unit, as a cult, as a unit, um, a kind of a we, and indeed, this chart led us to begin talking about this whole curve as an I, we, I curve. We start off in the 1890s very much focused on what's in it for me. We're very much focused on, um, I, on me, me, me. 
that's an I period. But then as you see, again, very familiarly in the early years of the 20th century, we begin to become a little less focused on I and a little more focused on we. And that rises steadily. Again, there's the, there's the um, little pause in the 20s, but then we begin to be ever more, year by year, we're becoming more focused on what we have in common, more altruistic, more focused, that more of a greater sense that we're all in this together until remarkably up there in 1964, it looks like suddenly that turns around and we begin to be, we don't become instantly an I society. Of course not. These things, these social changes occur slowly, but we pivoted and began to go down this long. And as it turned out, interminable trend toward greater narcissism, toward less altruism, towards more focus on what's in it for me and less focus on what we have in common. Let's see the next slide because here, I'm, uh, I'm gonna quickly end up here, Shailene. Um, you, here I put all four of those charts together and you can see they're not separate charts. It's one, this all, quite remarkably, it's astonishing that this is true, especially particularly because these are all underneath all these curves. There are scores and scores of individual data points and nevertheless, it shows that in economics, politics, society, and culture, America went through one huge swing. You might say a swing of the pendulum, although for reasons that Shailen will explain later, we're a little uncomfortable with the metaphor of a pendulum, but you can see began in an I period, moved to the we period, and then uh, back down now to the to a extremely I period. Let's have the next slide. The next slide just puts all these things together into a single curve. It's easy to do that because they are all so similar. And you can see it starts over there low. You can, and all these curves are basically quite astonishingly, basically show the same story, even that little pause during the twenties. And so this in a way summarizes what happened to America as we move from an emphasis on individualism to an emphasis on community from I to we, and then back down back down to I. But Shailene, why don't you pick up this story here and you can be a little, you know, you can expand a little bit more on what's, what's going on behind the scenes. What, what was happening historically that makes sense out of these curves? Sure, so, you know, um, I'd like to start off by pointing out that there's a lot of books that have actually been written about the downslope of this curve, really what's happened over the last half century. Um, in, in one article that I read, the, the, the author referred to it as the how America got in this mess genre of books, right? And a lot of these books focus on maybe one or a couple of the different phenomena that, that Bob described, um, but their focus is really on this sort of fall from grace. Um, the idea that America used to be great and, and we've slid down and, and the problem with some of these narratives as, as we see it is that um, that wasn't necessarily a golden age in American history. It had a lot of problems and we'll go back to some of that um, in a minute. For us, therefore, what's less interesting is the story of the downward slide. And what's more interesting is the story of the upward swing, hence the title of the book, which is The Upswing. And the reason that that's particularly fascinating to us is because when you look at this, both from the standpoint of the data which Bob just outlined, really hard measures. And also from the standpoint of the historical record, what, what life looked and felt like, America is in a remarkably similar place to where we were at the last Gilded Age. I mean, you can see that graphically here, but also that was true just in sort of the lived experience of, of what Americans were going through. And so our feeling is if ever there were a moment in American history whose lessons we need to learn today, it was the moment when Americans in a very similar situation to the one we find ourselves in today, turned things around, righted the ship and got America back on a track toward greater and greater equality, toward greater cohesion, toward greater altruism, um, really sort of reclaiming Americans, America's promise. And so if we go to the next slide, what we wanna do here is just look at that period of the upswing. What happened during that period that really set all of those upward trends in motion? So when people look at this data, at these graphs, they often ask us, you know, what's the thing that turned first? Like you, you're looking at economics, politics, society, culture. If you had to identify the one thing that started going upward first, which is it? Because if we knew what that was, well, maybe then we would know what the silver bullet is, what the thing is that we could focus on today that might turn everything around. And a lot of times people assume that that thing is economics. 
I think especially in the social sciences, we tend to have this kind of Marxist view of history, which is that, that economics drives everything and the rest is just details, right? Um, and that actually turns out not to be true. One of the things that does seem clear from the data is that economics was what we might call a lagging indicator. The economic equality came along after some of these other phenomena started to move in the right direction, which is a really interesting finding. So we know that economics is not the silver bullet, and at least it wasn't during this historical period. So what was, if we had to identify something that did turn first, what might it have been? Fascinatingly, when you sort of pair the data with the historical record, and granted, it is difficult looking back that far from a data perspective. It's, it's a little bit hard to find data sets that go back 125 years, although this is what Bob is famous for and, and as a statistician, is finding these obscure longitudinal data sets. And when we look at those data sets, it looks as though the culture of America is what changed first, that move from narcissism toward altruism. So, so what we want to talk about first about this period was that it was marked by a real significant moral and cultural shift. The Gilded Age was characterized by a culture called social Darwinism, which was the idea that, you, that, that Darwin's theory of survival of the fittest was not only something that was descriptive of the natural world, but was something that was a good way to think about organizing society. Basically, you know, it's a giant competition um, and whoever is strongest and fastest wins and the devil take the hindmost. And that was really the reigning ethos of the Gilded Age. And there, were, there was a group of reformers that came along and really said, you know, I don't, I'm not comfortable with this as a value system that reflects what America is about. And it, on the in the heels, sort of on the heels of that social Darwinist idea, came a movement called the social gospel. It originated in evangelical Protestantism, but ultimately became sort of more of a broad cultural ethos that said, you know, society is not just about competition. Society is about what we owe to one another, what we can do for the most vulnerable, what we can provide to everyone, what we the ways in which we are in this together, and that moral and cultural shift really motivated a whole movement of people that we now look back and called the progressives with a capital P to, to, to start a movement, to really get into the trenches and change America, motivated by this moral and cultural shift. So that was one really important facet, one of the earliest facets of the upswing. And that is an important lesson for today. If we are going to look for a way to spark another upswing today, we need to get comfortable with looking at and thinking about and talking about our problems through moral language, through a moral lens. Another lesson from this upswing is that it was an incredibly youth driven movement. The progressive era, the progressive movement was incredibly youth driven. And I just wanna pause here for a moment to say, when we talk about the progressive era, we're talking about the capital P progressive era. And that term progressive is used differently today as it, as it is to describe this historical moment. Today, we talk about progressive as the sort of leftmost side of the political spectrum. But back then the progressive era was really a bipartisan movement, almost, so diverse as to be barely coherent. That's how historians describe it. Um, there were people of all stripes who claimed the mantle of progressives. Um, in fact, in the 1912 presidential election, all three candidates were sort of jockeying for the title of most progressive candidate because it was such a popular movement and such a popular widespread ideal that had captured the American imagination. But a lot of the people that were driving this movement were super young. They were doing their work when they were in their 20s, in their 30s changing America. And so if we're going to look for an upswing today, it needs to come, we believe, from this sort of post baby boom generation, those young Americans who can really give us an innovative vision for, for thinking outside the box about how to solve Americans' problems. One of, these th one of the things that these young people and these young reformers really focused on was association. That's kind of an antiquated term. Um, it's a term that comes out of that historical period. That's how they would have described it. Today, we might describe it as relationship building or to use a term that Bob has popularized, social capital. They really focused on the power of people coming together and particularly people coming together across lines of difference. People who didn't understand each other, who wouldn't have an opportunity to meet in the public square. These progressives in invented a lot of initiatives to bring those people together. But also they recognized, as we showed in the data, that this was a really lonely and dislocated period. You had millions of Americans that had moved out of small towns, off of farms, into cities that were busy and 
commerce driven and all of the ways that people had for connecting in those small town American experiences no longer replied once they were in Chicago and New York. Um, and so you, you saw, as Bob described it, this civic boom, the invention of new ways of bringing people together through clubs and civic associations and service societies, religious organizations. This, there was a huge boom that really created a vast store of social capital that fueled this upswing for decades. Another thing that really characterized this progressive movement and characterized the upswing was grassroots innovation. So a lot of times, if, if any of, out there, if, of you out there have studied the progressive era, you might think of the things that sort of big national programs, the federal programs that came to characterize the progressive era, things like um, uh, the federal income tax, uh, child labor legislation, trust busting, um, consumer protection agency, all of these things, even you know um, constitutional amendments that the progressive era is famous for. But the fact of the matter is those things came later and they were actually not the start, they were sort of the caboose of this change, this change process. So many of the ideas, even things like a federal income tax were tried and tested at the local level, at the municipal level, at the state level by local innovators who looked around and, and didn't look to Washington to solve their problems. They looked to their fellow citizens to solve their problems. One of the, the best examples of this that we love to tell is the story of the public high school in America. Public high school is now such a, an integral part of America that you it's hard to imagine a time when that wasn't part of the American experience, a free public education for everyone up through secondary school. But at the time of the Gilded Age, um, secondary education was really only available to the wealthy. It was something you had to pay for, or you know, if you couldn't pay for it, you had to be super talented or super smart to get a scholarship, that sort of a thing. And um, because of the Industrial Revolution, you had people in towns all across America looking around parents really saying, if my child is going to succeed in this economy, they really need a secondary education. And so instead of saying, oh, you know, the federal government really should start providing secondary education. Instead of doing that, they actually looked to each other, banded together, passed, you know, local tax initiatives, created public high schools that were then available to every kid in town, simply by virtue of the fact that, that you lived in town. That was an entirely new idea that originated not from academia, not from Washington, but from small towns in the American Midwest. And then that idea sort of went viral over the course of a decade or two and ultimately blossomed into the systems of education that we have in this country today. Um, so that's an example of the way in which these progressives were really solving problems on their own doorstep. And then that became the blueprint for changes that could be applied more nationally. So if we are looking for solutions today, we really believe that we need to get really local we need to start in our neighborhoods, we need to start in our cities, we need to start right where we are in what Louis Brandeis, who's a famous progressive, called the laboratories of democracy. Those small towns, those localities where people can actually work across party lines a lot more effectively than, than they can in Washington to get things done and then show um, what works and, and have those solutions um, bubble up to the, to the national level. Another lesson from this period is actually that charismatic leadership came late in the story as well. Again, when you think of the progressive era, you think of people like Teddy Roosevelt, right? Um, but actually he came again quite late in the process. There were a lot of um, charismatic political leaders in this story, but they really sort of saw a parade that was already happening and got out in front of it. It wasn't that, that, that they were these leaders who had this big idea and everybody started to follow them. The opposite was actually true. And so again, today, um, you know, we've, we've seen a charismatic leader come and go from the White House in the last four years. And as Bob has mentioned, he didn't cause these downward trends. They started long before he got into the White House. But the same thing is going to be true of the solution. It's not going to come from some charismatic leader that's suddenly going to solve all of our problems. It certainly didn't happen that way before. We don't believe that it's going to happen that way again. We believe that the solution is going to come from citizens. And then hopefully we'll have some enterprising political leaders who will take those solutions and turn them into real bipartisan solutions. Um, so the last thing that we want to point out about this period, we've said a lot of great things about what the progressives did and lauding them sort of as these people that righted the ship in a dark moment of American history, right? But they weren't perfect. And there are not, there are some lessons from this period that are what we might call negative lessons, not positive lessons. The biggest of which, of course, is that the we 
that these progressives were building toward was simply not inclusive enough. Um, as we know, this we period, the we decades that we described, this upswing um, coincided with Jim Crow. Uh, furthermore, many of the progressives who were leading change were themselves racist. So a lot of the structural inequality, the structural racism that's knit into some of our programs, even some of our federal programs, um, some of that is certainly a legacy of the, this period in which you had a lot of people do, making a lot of progressive change in this country, but not necessarily extending that fully to everyone, especially to people of color. And so any we that we would hope to build toward today, any upswing that we would hope to see today has to be fully and completely inclusive. Um, because there are some ways, you know, we don't have time to go into detail now, but there are some important ways in which um, the upswing sort of um, created the seeds of its own demise by, by not being fully inclusive. And so that is a, a, a huge lesson from this period, something that absolutely must be top on the priority today um, as far as what, what would need to be on our agenda if we are hoping to see another we and another upswing. So if we could just go to the next slide, this quote from Teddy Roosevelt is something that really summarizes what we feel like is the lesson of the I, we, I century. This really breathtaking discovery that all of these phenomena turned together, both going upward and going downward. Roosevelt said the fundamental rule of our national life, the rule which underlies all others is that on the whole, and in the long run, we shall go up or down together. Good or bad, whether we recognize it or not, we are in this together as a, as a mass multicultural democracy. And we believe that there's real hope in the idea that we've been in a situation like this before, we've turned it around. We didn't push that we high enough. We didn't reach the summit of what was possible, but we think that there's a chance that we could do that again today, um, get the things right that we got wrong the last time and see another we, a new we, um, that takes us to even, even closer to the ideals upon which this country was founded. So that's kind of an overview of, of, of the book and some of the ideas that are in the book. Uh, and we're just super excited now to just be in conversation um, about some of the other issues uh, that might be on people's minds. Thank you so much. Um, as a, as a history teacher, I have to say, I very much appreciated your focus on the parallels you drew to the Gilded Age and to the Progressive Era, because these are two underappreciated periods of history, both by students and also by many of their teachers. Uh, as you created these inverted U-shaped curves, I was fascinated to, to sort of play along with the two of you in divining the ultimate cause or purpose behind these extraordinary shifts from an individualistic, I-focused society to a more communitarian, uh, we-focused America. And then back again. As I wrote my immediate reactions to every one of your arguments on a post-it note, and you can see my book is almost warped from all of these, um, you did something in a subsequent paragraph that I always tell my students that they must attempt in their own writing. Uh, that's addressing the other side of the argument or the reader's possible objection. I still developed my own theories regarding causation and I quibbled over a little bit of the methodology, but honestly, I found your intellectual honesty um, to be quite refreshing. So uh, for example, besides the four areas of focus we saw in the curves, um, I wondered how inclusive those curves were of other factors. And Shailen, you were already hinting at this, such as race. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I might just take that question just because I happen to have done a lot of the writing around race for the book. And, um, you know, I think what's interesting is that we know that that we period in American history, that first two thirds of the century was, was extremely ex um, exclusive and not inclusive, right? In, in often really violent ways. Um, and so how does that story square? The story of race in America in the 20th century, how does that square with this I, we, I century? And so when, um, when we were looking at this, even, even the story that, that we sort of brought to this was, well, you know, that just must be like a completely glaring exception to this argument, right? right. And, and that's often the view that we have when we think about um, the, the trends in racial equality over this period. We often think that 
because the outlook for African Americans was so bleak at the beginning of the century, and Jim Crow was such a, a violent and real reality that the idea is sort of that nothing changed for those first six decades of the century, and then suddenly everything changed during the civil rights revolution. And that turns out to be true for a lot of things. Actually, Black political representation is one that didn't change markedly during that period. Um, the longstanding white supremacy in mainstream culture, mainstream media, um, access to professional schools and jobs, um, residential segregation. These are all examples that would look in, in contrast to that inverted U, which is like better and better and better, it more like a hockey stick, no change. And then, and then sudden positive change in the 1960s. But interestingly, when you look at different metrics, specifically material equality, the curve looks quite a bit different. So when we talk about material equality, we're talking about things like um, income equality. We're talking about home ownership. We're talking about health measures like um, infant mortality or, um, or let's see, um, even things like voting, voter participation, voter registration. We're talking about education, um, you know, completing degrees, completing high school. When you look at those measures and you compare the progress toward parity or equality between blacks and whites, what you actually see is that the bulk of the progress toward equality happened during that first two thirds of the 20th century, which is actually a big surprise, not a surprise to, to black Americans because they lived that story, right? But actually a surprise I think to a lot of white Americans to see that most of the progress on those metrics came before the civil rights movement. And then when you look at those same metrics after the civil rights movement, you would think, okay, we had this moment where finally we dismantled you know, legal barriers to, to integration. Certainly those measures would have accelerated toward full equality. When in fact, the opposite is true. We see stagnation. On many of those measures, we see reversal of progress such that black Americans are doing worse today than they were in 1968 on things like homeownership, on things like graduation from college, right? And those are really, I, I wanna say shocking, but I can say that just because I'm a white person, that is not shocking to black Americans. That is the underlying call to a clarity that the Black Lives Matter movement is putting forward, which is saying in the wake of the civil rights movement where white Americans said, oh, finally, you know, we took care of this problem. In fact, we didn't take care of the problem. And what's fascinating about this to us is that when you map that, that data onto the IWI curve, which is our bigger thesis, right? What does it mean? Well, it looks, you, what you find is actually that the we decades were actually a bit more hospitable to progress toward equality between the races than were the I decades. And so there's a lot of explanations for this. I mean, it, it begs a lot of questions. First of all, how did black Americans make that, that progress during a period characterized by segregation and Jim Crow? The short answer to that, and again, we've written a whole chapter on this as well as, a, as a, an op-ed in the New York Times on this for people who wanna get into it, but the short answer is the great migration. Black right. Americans essentially stood up and claimed their place within the American we. They started building their own associations, their own schools, their own hospitals. So it was a highly racialized we, but it was nonetheless a we in which they were making progress toward the American dream. And, and, and then the question, of course, is what caused the stagnation after the civil rights movement when we would have expected it to keep going? A lot of that has to do, frankly, with white backlash. Mm -hmm. During the peak of the we was that moment when we had this kind of fragile national consensus where we finally could pass the civil rights legislation. And people, when you look at the survey data, were, were very much in support of those things in principle. But then when the Johnson administration tried to put them in practice, they tried to do busing, they tried to do integration, the survey data really flips and Americans, white Americans start to say, not in my backyard. And so it's hard to say whether that broader turn toward I that happened at the same time drove the white backlash or whether the white backlash drove the, the broader turn toward I, that's something that we can't say, but the two factors were definitely intertwined. And I think it's a hard lesson for America to learn that a society that is incredibly focused on me, on competition, on what's in it for me, on my rights, not my responsibilities, is not a society that's going to achieve racial equality. And I actually think that interestingly, that's a lot of what the Black Lives Matter movement is, Black Lives Matter movement is trying to call us to see. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, Spiro, can I just add, because this is a Chicago audience, yeah. and what we what Shailen has just described is actually consistent with, if you know anything about Chicago, that is the, the, the great migration created the South Side. Mm -hmm. 
and 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 it was by folks coming from up from the Mississippi Delta and ending up on the south side of Chicago. Brownsville, it was sometimes called in those years. And this is important. Blacks know very well what I'm about to say. The, the hospitals and the schools and so on in the south side were way inferior to the hospitals and the schools on the north side of, of Chicago and in, and in Evanston, for example. But in terms of equality, what was true was that the, the schools and the hospitals and so on the south side of Chicago were way better than the schools and hospitals available to blacks in, Missis in the Mississippi Delta, which is where the people were coming from. And that's how it was possible for blacks by themselves, by trekking up the Mississippi River on the, you know, on these trains that all, we have a whole bunch, we have a whole music college, a whole music literature devoted to the, this period of moving up the, from the Mississippi Delta to the, to the cities of the North. And just one last sentence, this is the story that, that Michelle Obama tells in her biography. It's exactly the story that she tells. Her grandparents moving up, her parents doing reasonably well, and, and her making progress on the shoulders, but then Americans stopped after that being so uh, sympathetic to, to, to the continued, the, un, the still unmet needs of, of, the black, of black folks. I don't think you can emphasize enough the momentous nature of that great migration. Right. There's been nothing like that in our history. Right. Um, and as you know, Blacks were segregated, uh, which is tragic, but it also gave them a power base yes, in terms exactly of churches, right. organizations. Um, and then, you know, as people are making more money, they can contribute to things like that we know the United Negro College Fund. Absolutely. And those college students were the, you know, the foot soldiers of the civil rights movement. So, right. you know, any student of history will tell you, you know, there's going to be long term causes and short term causes. And right. it was kind of a revolution of uh, rising expectations, I think, as people got economic power in society. So great. Can I just recommend anybody who wants to dig into this further must read Isabel Wilkerson's book, The Warmth of Other Suns, mm -hmm. um, which is just a fantastic account of the incredible work that Black Americans were doing to build the we in America. Absolutely. Yeah, we've used uh, expert excerpts of that in our American Studies curriculum as well. So yeah. it's great. Sure. Um, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit then, um, because I, there's a question I think people people have in their minds now that the book is out there and now we've had certain recent events uh, that have been uh, quite upsetting. So um, according to a recent uh, Marist NPR PBS NewsHour uh, poll, it said that about only 20% of Americans currently believe the nation is on the right track. Big surprise. And that number is at its lowest point in 20 years. A oh, year what? ago, it was like double that. Yeah. And that may have everything to do with the coronavirus pandemic, but I suspect we'd all disagree with that. Um, however, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. Sure. What arguably could be called a protest clearly turned into an act of domestic terrorism, uh, even though we still don't know all the details behind what happened. And given the low point on the curve we currently occupy, I still feel obligated to ask you, how do you think we got here politically? How do you interpret that event? Well, so, Shannon, can I start? And then you, you I know we both have thoughts about this. The first thing, that, Spiro, that you and, and the other people in on this discussion need to know is our book was in the hands of the publishers in, yeah. in a year ago now, in January of 2020, sure. way before the pandemic, the economic collapse, the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the what happened, you know, the, the, the extreme polarization of the of the presidential election and the and the so our book was written knowing nothing about that yeah. and yeah. um and therefore yes. I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna i'm not gonna duck the question but i'm just asking your readers to understand our book is is at the level of changes that are made over a century over decades mm -hmm. and now we're dealing with changes that happen over a matter of hours yeah. and um historians may be useful in offering perspective we think we are but we're not good at predicting the next two hours. I mean, it's just not the framework that we're yeah. thinking about. 
Um, so I'm going to answer the question, but I want to, I'm going to answer the question. It's going to require something that is a little bit for, uh, for a pair of historians like us, a little bit of an unnatural act, actually, to try to, okay. Okay. To, try to interpret what's happened in the last week or two. Yeah. Um, the, another thing to say, as I said earlier, is the bigger change, the bigger shift to I has been, had been underway for decades before anybody even heard of, mm -hmm. of, of um, Trump. And what follows from that is his leaving office or maybe leaving office or maybe not leaving office will not solve the bigger problem. It's, a, right. it's gonna take us years, maybe a decade or two to get to complete this pivot if we're in the middle of a pivot and we, and we hope we are. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, it's true that the extreme polarization that, we've, that we saw on January 6th um, is clearly, you can see the roots of that going back decades. And you can see it now we're beginning to remember, even, even you know, news commentators are remembering, that we saw this in the Tim McVeigh period. That was another period of white nationalism, white nationalism that led to violent actions. And so this, what I'm really trying to say is don't get too focused, even if you're only interested in what's going to happen tomorrow, don't get too focused right, right. on this year or two. It's these trends all have deep roots. Now, if, if historians are not so good about telling you how, how to interpret the last two days, mm -hmm. they may also be even worse. We think we are even worse, actually, at predicting the future. That's not what we're in. Yeah. Nevertheless, um, Shailen and I are going to say just a word about that, because I know that that's on the mind of a lot of people here. Yeah, sure. And um, shall, shall I go first or you go first? We have a complimentary. Mm -hmm. um, she will explain why. We have complimentary but not identical views about what's, what's happening right now and what will happen. Right. Um, I'm pretty optimistic, actually, that things that have been happening in this year after we wrote the book mm. um, are illustrations of that the pivot may be underway already. Take, for example, the fact that we said in the book, written long before any of this last year, we said it's going to take a generation of young people who are morally committed to themselves getting involved in civic life mm -hmm. and leading the rest of us. And that's the the you know the Greta Thunberg and the and the uh, the people who are concerned about the environmental crisis or the kids from the, the high school in um, in Florida that, you know, are leading the anti- for our lives that you mentioned that also. Right. And, and, and um, or for that matter, the, the Black Lives Matter movement is also being led heavily by young people. Mm -hmm. In the first instance, by young black, but actually also young white people. All of that would, would make you, and I could go through the other lessons we learned from the, the previous period. And there are some seriously interesting um, parallels that would lead you to think, well, maybe we're all, maybe you just are, we're only, a, you know, you were about six months early in publishing this book. The, you know, the, 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 the pivot was already underway. Right. On the other hand, it's possible to be more pessimistic and to think it's going to be a long time before we get past the uh, white nationalists, especially the white nationalist uh, terrorism. I don't, I, and Shannon, you and I have different, slightly different views, and you'll explain why we have slightly different views, if you would. <laughs> yeah, so so Bob and I share um, the same political views. However, he happens to live in a zip code where 75% of his neighbors voted for Biden, and I happen to live in a zip code where 75% of my neighbors voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I have friends of friends who went to the Capitol on January 6th, mm -hmm. um, which I struggle to make sense of deeply struggle. Sure, sure. Um, and so, so for me, I'm a little bit more exposed to the reality of the thinking of people who still are pushing in this direction, right? And so one thing I just wanna point out that the, the broad lesson here is of the story of the IWI curve is the story of pivot moments. And when you think about the definition of a pivot, um, a pivot means that you're standing in one place and, and before you were facing this direction and now suddenly you're facing a new direction, meaning that all the energy you were putting in this direction now suddenly goes in a new direction, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you're still standing in the same dark hole, right? You still <laughs> gotta dig your way out, even if yeah. you've decided to stop yeah. digging your way deeper. Sure. And so um, my, the hope is that January 6th was a moment where people sort of woke up to, to how deep the hole is getting. Mm 
mm. and are going to pivot and start putting their energy in a different direction. You know, I look around my neighborhood and I'm not sure. I don't know what my neighbors are thinking. I'm a little afraid to ask, right? Mm. Um, and so, but I think that the other thing to know about these pivots is that people often ask us like, you know, when will we know that we're in the upswing? You know, and it's like, well, during the last upswing, there were a lot of countervailing forces still pushing in that same dark direction even while the progressives were there in the trenches trying to move America forward. And so we need to understand that I don't think that the, that the upswing is gonna look like all of a sudden, all of America changes its mind about where we're headed. It has a moral reformation and we, un, we suddenly feel like we're all in this together. It's not gonna feel like that for a long time. Um, so we can be in the midst of a pivot. And I actually do believe that we are pivoting, but, it's, but in the end, it's a matter of critical mass, meaning that individuals have to exercise their agency to figure out which direction they're gonna put their energy. The more of us who sit on the fence, the less likely it is that this is gonna turn into an upswing. But what are the role of, let's say, social media? That was one of the questions an audience a member was asking. You know, is it still possible, you know, to do the changes we need in order to bring about an upswing, given the role of, you know, algorithms and how we've been kind of siloed in terms of our opinions? I mean, some of the things that, you know, the theories that have been espoused by certain people seem wild, like they seem uh, completely, um, you know, out of control in terms of just uh, the, the feasibility of something like that. We've always had conspiracy theories, but. You know, no, that, 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 that is for sure true. Um, sorry, uh, Shailen, I didn't want to uh, yeah. jump in front of you, but I'll, uh, this is a tough question, so I'll take the bullet for the team. Um, <laughs> um, um, no, that's, I'm sorry, that's a terrible metaphor. Can we, yeah, can yeah, we, can yeah. We, it's fine, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> Go back and erase keep that. Keep moving, metaphor. Bob, keep moving. <laughs> um, so I don't know for sure um, about what, what difference that, how much difference social media make. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say a couple of, just a couple of things quickly about that, but it's a very big, complicated question. I'm, I'm not just trying to talk it, it's a really big, complicated question. One, mm -hmm. um, for a long while, people thought, even after I wrote Bowling Alone, that, okay, we may not have bowling leagues, but at least we've got Facebook. That is that face-to-face that -face connections could be easily replaced by, by um, virtual connections. Right. The one thing that the, that the uh, corona, that the epidemic has taught us is that's just not true. Mm -hmm. People are desperate to hug their grandmother or their grandchild and that's because and that's that's because face-to-face -face connections matter in social media though they are important of course they are important they're not actually as important as face-to-face -face size that's the first point i'd make secondly the um it's true that we're in the middle of a major communications revolution but so were they then it's really mm -hmm. easy to miss that that america in 1900 was just living through immense technological changes that was changing in fundamental ways the people you connected with. And I'm thinking of the telephone, for goodness sakes. The, yeah. telephone, was, the telephone was even more important than the internet, for goodness sakes, because it meant for the first time in human history, you could talk to someone without being in their physical presence. So the telephone and the radio and the automobile all meant that you were, you're, you realistically were connected in you know, a lot of different ways. And nevertheless, the story that we tell is true of that period. And, and in fact, it turns out that back then, people dramatically overestimated what difference the telephone was going to make or the car was going to make. In the end, what the car or the telephone did was to enable us to do a little more efficiently what we've been doing before. Yeah. And, and that's so, I don't know, I should, I'll give you the last word on the on the. Well, uh, on the social media, on the, on the entire internet. <laughs> to, to the point, though, about misinformation, disinformation, right. people living in an alternate oh, yeah. reality. I mean, right. a a parallel that comes to my mind is think about this period in American history called the Progressive Era was characterized by eugenics. People mm -hmm. literally believed a completely false claim right. that there were genetic differences that made white people superior to everyone else on earth. It was believed so fully that it captivated most of academia during that time. It wasn't until the Holocaust that that really was fully rooted out of our, I mean, so it's like there are parallels here of where people believe stuff that was just wildly false, right? I mean, mm -hmm. this isn't the first time that, that stuff like this has captivated Americans. And really, honestly, it's about, it's about flooding the falsity with truth. 
Again, it's about that idea of critical mass, I think, both in terms of what we're putting out onto social media and in terms of how we are using social media. Bob often likes to point out, you know, if we use social media as a place to fight with people, then that's what the internet will be, a place to fight with people. But if more of us begin demanding that the internet be a place where we come together and doing that ourselves, that's what it will become. It's really in our hands. And again, another character, I know we're almost out of time, but another characteristic of that um, progressive period was the, the belief that there were just so many forces beyond our control, that it was out of our hands, that that mm-hmm. that the big forces had come to take democratic agency away. But these progressives said, that's not true. And we're going to prove it to you. And we need a generation of young people today who get on the exact same um, belief and put it into action and say, it doesn't matter how big these forces are, how, how ugly the falsehoods are, we have the power to change this. We're going to do it today. If anybody could do it, it's our students, right? Uh, like oh, yeah. my students, they are, they've grown up on this. So they know how to use it as a tool. I mean, the the ver, you know the virality of it is is the part I think I always worry about how easily it spreads. But you know, it's important to to say to keep in mind your students and even my students. I've just stopped recently teaching, but I you know I've got I had students who were the age of my grandchildren. Mm-hmm. Those kids have never lived in their lives lived in a society that was moving in the right direction. I mean by that in a direction of more equality, more cooperation, more, um, you know, less polarization and so on. They don't know that it is possible to change and therefore they're very cynical. And so the fundamental message we are, are, are trying to convey to, especially the kids is, look at this historical, go beyond your own lived experience. And if you do go beyond your lived experience, you can see you don't have to be cynical. Those people 150 years ago could have been cynical, but they actually, I don't mean they fixed forever the problem. They moved the country for 70 years. Think big is what we want to say. Think about devoting your life to moving this country in the right direction. And there's a good chance you could do it because people just like you have done it before. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting in my sermon mode here, but I, I really feel very strongly that that's, this book is meant not just to be a descriptive one, it's meant to change America. Mm-hmm. I think that's an argument. I think that this is where we could end as well, but I think it's an argument for more history education, right? (laughs) More progressive era and, you know, in in contrast to the the Gilded Age. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for this uh, opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I see Lonnie, you want to... uh, Maybe yeah, tell us uh, where we're uh, going next. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I'm not a historian, so I guess I can make all kinds of predictions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I can predict is we're going to end in about 30 seconds. So I want to just say that, um, Bob, as always, it was such a pleasure to host you again. We had so much fun with you uh, last time you were here in Chicago in Evanston, um, you and your lovely wife. And Sh- Shailen, <laughs> pleasure to get to know you as well. Hope you both will come back. And Spiro, thank you so much. I love high school history teacher coming and just doing this conversation. You are right in touch with the very generation that Bob and Shailen are talking about so much. So I love the energy here. A reminder to anyone watching, um, if you want to ask some questions, you want to join in the conversation, we've been putting links in chat to buy a copy of The Upswing. Buy a copy. The bookstall will be sending you a link to register for the little after hours that we're going to be hosting. It's a nice casual environment. You'll be able, cameras will be on. You can ask questions. So please join us. So on behalf of everyone in Fanland, thank to all three of you for your service to our community. We're very much appreciative. 